Um, well, it's my great honor to welcome John Bridgeland today uh, to our seminar series. Really a great honor. Um, uh, Bridge and I, we know each other through work in the COVID collaborative that uh, Bridge uh, co-founded and is the CEO of, and we will talk more about this collaborative today in our discussion. Um, I apologize in ahead of time that I will not be able to go into all details of, of uh, Bridge's very um, distinguished bio, but I will just highlight a few things that are really, um, really important. So he's currently the founder and CEO of Civic, a social enterprise firm in Washington, D.C. He's also the executive chairman of the Office of American Possibilities, a moonshot factory to tap the entrepreneurial talents of Americans to solve public challenges together across divides. And I think this is really a very big theme uh, of his work is that he's reaching um, across divides. And in this capacity, he has really co-founded, became the CEO of this COVID collaborative, which is a national uh, platform to combat um, COVID-19, but also really to bring uh, political and, um, and social forces together to, um, to go ahead in a united manner. He is also the co-chairman of Welcome US to inspire, educate, and engage Americans in supporting the resettlement of Afghan, Ukrainian, and other refugees. And he's the co-founder of Act Now, a ground-up effort to re-envision community safety and policing. And it's co-founder of Partnership for American Democracy to align efforts in democratic renewal around five sustainable, sustainable demo, democracy goals. So you see that um, his work is really, um, you know, he's really right in the uh, in the middle of all the important issues that are um, that are um, dominating our current life. But he has done, um, you know, a lot um, also in the medical area. Not only COVID, he's also the founding CEO and vice chairman of Malaria No More and senior advisor to the United Nations Special Envoy for Malaria where he has really done a lot of public and private sector work um, to end malaria death in Africa. That's a big connection also with the, today's work and uh, uh, on, on COVID. Um, something that has uh, gathered interest from our audience today is that he's also the co-founder and vice chairman of the Service Year Alliance, which is an initiative to create a civilian national service counterpart to military service in the United States. And he's the co-convener of the Grad Nation campaign to address the high school dropout crisis. He was in 2010 appointed um, to the White House Council for uh, Community Solutions. Um, and he has previously served as director of the White House Domestic Policy Council in the first term of President uh, George W. Bush. Um, he has co-chaired the White House Task Force Dis for Disadvantaged Youth, co-led the cabinet level review on climate change, and has worked on the re revitalization of New York City after 9-11. So many, many, many important things where he has been um, featured um, really widely on TED Talks, on Oprah, on Anderson Cooper, um, where he has really been um, giving important insight. He has also co-authored the book Teaching America, The Case for Civic Education. Um, and, he star and he has worked with the National Parks Conser Conservation Association actually to develop the centennial initiative and challenge to strengthen our national parks. Very important. Um, he graduated with honors in government from Harvard University, um, and he has trained also at the College of Europe and the University of Brussels as a Rotary International Fellow. Um, he received his JD from the University of Virginia School of Law, um, and he has served on many initiatives, including the, moon, uh, the National Moon Court team. Um, but he um, also holds quite a few honorary degrees from various colleges. Um, but he started his professional career by practicing law in New York and in Paris, um, where he was also an active pro bono uh, practitioner representing political asylum applicants. He was the chief of staff and counsel to um, two U.S. congressmen, where he has, you know, played leading roles in in designing and in, in signing um, bills into law. Um, and I guess this um, this work has sort of prepared him for his. Uh, his 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 current work and really his his um, his um, 
his generation are, are building of, uh, of bridges across uh, divides and also um, really the collaboration that he's featuring today um, in this talk. Just a, a fun fact at the end, uh, Bridge is also an avid tennis player. Um, and as, as he does what he always does, he is uh, founded Tennis for America, a year of service program designed for former college tennis players. So um, with this, I, I stop here. I could go on and on and on, but this would um, use the whole hour um, and give the work, uh, word over to Bridge. Just a, a little um, announcement to, to start with. This is not your regular seminar today. This is really an interactive um, discussion. Um, where I will be asking questions, but I will also take questions from the audience. So you have two choices. You can uh, either raise your hand and Alexa will unmute you and you can ask your question directly, or you can continue to write them in the, in the Q&A and I will ask them for you. So without further ado, Rich, thank you so much for being here. I'm really very honored. Um, we all are, and uh, we're really looking forward to hearing um, about all your important initiatives. Thank you so much, Melanie, <clears throat> and everyone on this seminar and uh, for all you've done at the Gladstone Institute and in Evan at the Quantitative Bioscience Institute. It was wonderful to hear a little glimpse before this uh, webinar about how you all are fostering such innovative collaborations. Great to be with you. Well, maybe we can start and um, you just tell us a little bit more about the COVID collaborative. Um, how did it all start and uh, why did you form it? So in 2020, when the pandemic was breaking, um, I was uh, worried there was no national plan and governors were seeking guidance all across the country. And I, I also realized that when a pandemic meets a system of federalism, it could be a recipe for disaster unless you had a, a stronger sense of a whole country response and that what happens locally and at the state level uh, and nationally need to somehow be a, a little more integrated and woven together. So um, uh, having uh, served in the White House uh, and actually uh, for both President Obama and President Bush and, 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 and being called upon to served to rally a nation after 9-11 around national service and volunteering. Um, I was actually shocked that there wasn't more of a call to service uh, for Americans to come together in common purpose. So um, I also realized there's such extraordinary talent and expertise and institutional reach in the country. And I just wanna thank you, Melanie and Monica Gandhi and Bob for being such wonderful partners of the COVID uh, Collaborative. Um, and so we also recognized that policymakers weren't making decisions in a vacuum. So we assembled top experts, leaders and in institutions in health, education and the economy, and also representing the diversity of the country. Um, and uh, everyone said, yes, they all wanted to collaborate. And they did so across politics and across uh, sectors. So we were um, thrilled with the response and we've been at it since uh, you know, literally the summer of 2020, and it's continuing in earnest these days with uh, uh, an intense focus on initiatives that fill gaps. And ever since the, the uh, President Biden's team came in office, we've been in weekly briefings with the White House on a whole host of, of issues. And, and thanks to our experts, they've been able to make really, ex I think, extraordinary contributions. Yeah, just tell us a little bit more how it works concretely. So who is part of it? How do you communicate with the different parties? And, uh, and then we can talk more about the concrete initiatives that, that the collaborative has done. Yeah, I guess I was struck. We do so little in the country to tap uh, and provide platforms for shared work. I, I reached out to, I'll give you an example, Kathleen Sebelius and Mike Levitt, who had been secretaries of health and human services in two different administrations, Tom Frieden, um, a former CDC director, Mark McClellan, former FDA commissioner, but also the head of the Business Roundtable, the NAACP, uh, Unidos US, National Congress of American Indians, and many others, and provided a platform for shared work. I said there will be no, no mandatory meetings or, or annoying bureaucracy, but there will be intense opportunities to make common cause on really important aspects uh, of the response. So as you know, Melanie, because you and Monica were involved 
there was a need for a governor's compact on COVID response before there was a national plan. So we assembled uh, all the experts, you know, in, in the, on masking, uh, uh, social distancing, uh, vaccines, treatments, the various pieces of, of the response puzzle and created working with um, the health commissioners in the states and the governors, a governor's compact on COVID response. And just to give you a little anecdote of the flavor of this, Kathleen Sebelius and Dirk Kempthorne and Deval Patrick, who were, uh, were all former governors, were literally calling me at the end of every day, <laughs> reporting on which governors they had lined up behind the compact or what input they wanted to share to make it better. And that sort of was a prox uh, approximation of a, uh, a concerted plan that helped to guide the response when we didn't have a national plan. Uh, we have lots of other examples. We, we, um, there wasn't a public awareness campaign and messaging is so critical to reach millions of Americans. So uh, working with the Ad Council, we generated a $250 million vaccination education campaign and uh, brought in um, all sorts of key stakeholders uh, to, to make that as effective as possible. And then eventually when HHS came out with their campaign to work in concert, very close concert with uh, the government's uh, messaging and plan, which was not easy. And there were a lot of uh, uh, difficulties with the messaging from the government that uh, were, were challenging. You also worked, um, had a very big focus on children who have lost a parent or other caregiver to COVID. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about why you focused on this and how you moved the White House and administration to add? Sure, so we, I had um, worked on the president's malaria initiative and then uh, malaria no more. And also in the context of going to uh, so many sub-Saharan African countries where mostly women and children under five were needlessly being, um, um, you know, uh, lives lost or, or impacted by this fully preventable and treatable disease, uh, saw AIDS and, and malaria orphans, literally children who were uh, left parentless by these, these diseases. And as we saw the numbers mount, um, we started to, to look at the uh, incredible volume of young people in America, and of course, also globally now, who had lost a parent or in-home caregiver to COVID-19 and also studied not just you know, the devastating impacts of that, but what does evidence tell us about parental loss that we could marshal in the way of solutions. So we organized a letter, which you, Melanie, and, and uh, Monica and Bob all signed together with these other powerful experts and institutions to the President of the United States saying, take executive action to shape a coordinated response and uh, we'll come by your side. And so he did it. He did a presidential memorandum highlighting the 200,000 COVID bereaved children. And we're working very closely with uh, his team on a uh, response that will help identify, connect, uh, and support uh, these children and their families. We also uh, initiated a hidden pain clearinghouse, working with sadly funeral directors, faith based leaders, school leaders, you know, where these young people. Will be coming in contact in their families with these with these institutions so we can connect them to the resources that uh, uh, from funeral reimbursement expenses to categorical eligibility for head start and snap which we hope will happen uh, to other supports peer peer and grief camps uh, mental health counseling etc well that's wonderful we've got it um question from Toby Nagel, who says, I'm curious, how have you been able to fund these various initiatives? You know, it's interesting. My experience is the, the, the risk is thinking too small, but when you have a big idea and an effort that the country embraces, um, funding hasn't been a problem. I actually uh, had two funders initially reach out to me and say, you know, there's no national plan. We heard through the National Governors Association and other partners that this COVID collaborative is being formed. Tell us about it, we'd like to fund it. And so we, we actually had funders reach out to us uh, to support the initiative. And then we have a pretty small team at the collaborative, but then our resources, you know, very, we tried to be very strategic, would go out to organizations that had the comparative advantage to do the work we were undertaking 
and we'd engage them in a subcontract uh, to do that work, but also in alignment with other institutions that should be at the table and also the groups representing the diversity of the country, um, uh, which was very important given the disproportionate impact of COVID on uh, American Indians, uh, uh, Black Americans, Latinos, uh, Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians, uh, and they, so they were all part of the, the uh, work. That, that's great. I wanted to dig a little bit deeper more into the um, the ad campaign that you have co-launched 250 million to boost vaccination among among Americans. I mean, there's really I mean, what the pandemic has shown is that there's really quite a bit of a disconnect, um, you know, between what we uh, what we can achieve in science and what people accept. Um, you know, I think your work reaching in deep into these communities is really necessary and important um, to actually have people take a vaccine once it's ready against a life-threatening disease. And I just wanted to sort of hear more about what you think went wrong here actually with, um, you know, with, with our communication um, and, um, getting people on board? So I think, you know, first uh, we were at ground zero and went from ground zero to 83, 84% of the population getting at least one shot. We still have a lot of work to do. And even the older Americans are not getting boosters at the rate they ought to. Um, so having a, a campaign with the Ed Council was absolutely critical. Given it had also been, you know, when I spoke with Julio Frank, the former Secretary of Health at uh, for Mexico, and now the president of Miami University, who's part of our COVID collaborative, he said, "I've been through six pandemics, and this is the only one that's been, polit you know, dramatically politicized." And so, knowing that going into the um, transition, the new administration, at the inauguration, we got President Obama, President Bush, President Clinton to cut a joint PSA to try to send transcend politics and set the a different tone in terms of what our national leaders were saying and, and the first ladies, God love Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter deep into their nineties, uh, go look at our website and you know, they're out there pushing the PSAs and the message. But most importantly, um, we went to the medical community, to the doctors, the nurses, the pharmacists, the associations representing them and started there because the messengers are as important as the messages and people trust, you know, our survey showed and other evidence showed people trust their doctors, their local healthcare professionals to give them the best guidance on uh, uh, medical decisions, including how to respond to COVID. But we also partnered with um, faith based groups because our survey data showed uh, people listened at some, you know, some level to their uh, faith based leaders and communities, country music stars, the sports leagues set an amazing example. We got some really prominent coaches who are beloved in their states uh, doing PSAs, um, of course, parents and teachers groups. Um, we, we really did in businesses, workplace. When we looked at where are Americans every day, schools, workplaces, business, um, faith-based institutions during the pandemic virtually, but you can still reach millions of them. We tried to be creative in, in mobilizing sectors. Uh, in terms of what went wrong, I think one thing I discovered was the CDC is full of such extraordinary people, including Dr. Rochelle Walensky, and, uh, but they have so little capacity to actually be <laughs> shaping and, and communicating clear messages. And I was struck by the difference between their public charge and the resources and the capacities they have to pull that off. And so you need efforts like our campaign with the Ed Council, the HHS effort. But even then, um, it's not as it is not as coordinated and as efficient as it ought to be. So how did your how did your experience with the White White House, your past experiences, how did did it help you, you know, navigate especially this political and politicizing part of of COVID? Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting. Governor Mike Levitt, when we uh, had a webinar with him, um, said, you know, this isn't just a COVID response. It's all about trust. Uh, and there are such low levels of trust in government and institutions and each other. 
um, uh, you know, over the past number of years, actually kind of growing since the mid 1960s. It's also about the role and size of government in our lives. There's such a libertarian streak in, in the United States. So understanding that landscape was really, really important to begin with. And um, so we, we tried to get creative. I'll give you an example. A Republican former governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie, who was close to Donald Trump, President Trump, went to a White House event, uh, unmasked, uh, got COVID. Um, seven days later, you know, he was, he was in, in the ICU for seven days. Uh, it almost took his life. And he had two relatives who, who passed away from COVID. And so we put, we talked to Chris and we put him in PSAs all across the United States, speaking to Republicans or others who for, you know, political reasons might've been hesitant. Asa Hutchinson, the governor of Arkansas, was a real leader in promoting COVID response. We wrote an op-ed with him called, uh, a mask is the uniform of a responsible citizen. Um, and uh, tried to get creative in mobilizing rural health, country music, sports. Um, we marshaled evidence with Chris Murray's Institute out in uh, Washington, not just by state and county, but by zip code showing governors and other policymakers in, in states that, um, you know, in a county, the vaccination rate could be pretty good and the hesitancy could be pretty low. But by zip code, it was like a tale of two different zip codes. And armed with that evidence, there were focused efforts in those areas in their states uh, to boost uh, vaccines. Um, the other thing I'd say is I was on the committee that awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, highest civilian honor, and, and uh, Dr. Tony Fauci had won that award uh, for his work on AIDS and, and many uh, other efforts. And it was just remarkable to me to see such an extraordinary public servant serving so many presidents um, to get the, the political attacks that he's gotten. And it's a, it's a difficult, dangerous time, um, but we tried to be creative in, in approaching it uh, in terms of our, our response. This is yeah. This is uh, this is tough times, and I think we we all grateful for for you know all the work that's being done to actually you know go against it and and correct it in some way. But I, I, before we come back to COVID, maybe and the current work of the collaborative, we can dive a little bit more into your other experiences and, and sure. initiatives that you have started. I mean, you worked with schools, workplaces, sports teams. What what? How do you, um, how, this is just still, I guess, COVID related, but I think in general, sure. also you have the, um, the um, you know, high school dropout rates, the, um, you know, many refugees. Um, how, how, how do you decide where to engage yourself and, um, and how does this all fit together? You know, it's interesting on, on schools. I remember I was in elementary school, Melanie, when I first got my, you know, vaccinations, I got my vaccinations there. And I even remember what the vaccinations looked like and how there was this culture of, you know, keeping everyone safe. And it was, it was a given. Um, and so when we were working on the COVID response, one of the early things we signaled to the White House was schools as vaccination sites. And that schools are often trusted institutions locally not just the children, but the parents and other members of the communities come to these places. And why not have vaccination sites in schools that would uh, uh, vaccinate the, you know, eventually the, obviously the children at the appropriate age, but the parents and community members. And so um, that actually took off with the Council of the Great City Schools and other partners, the Rural Schools Collaborative and the uh, Superintendents Association we brought into the COVID Collaborative and it was going actually remarkably well. And, and they were locating vaccination sites in um, areas of their di school districts where uh, uh, uptake was low and, and uh, there needed to be more work to be done. Uh, and then eventually it hit the, hit the wall of national hesitancy where we were at the point where we're gonna get just about everybody vaccinated who wanted to. <laughs> Um, and, and the vaccinations fell off. But I, I look at institutions like schools, workplaces, faith-based institutions for the leverage they can bring to help solve public problems. 
And on workplaces, you know, the private sector employs 125 million Americans. So we worked with the private sector to create, you know, with you, Melanie and Monica and Bob and the great people you have, COVID safe zones and got more than 200 companies representing millions of Americans, uh, employees to join um, the measure to get vaccinated uh, or you had to get tested. And a lot of people didn't wanna get tested, you know, every couple of days. So they would get vaccinated, show their proof of vaccination and bypass the routine testing requirements. So it was a powerful incentive. Uh, on the other issues, I worked on the high school dropout problem for 20 years. You know, a third of the nation was dropping out every year. Um, and we did a, a survey with the Gates Foundation showing that of dropouts of these young people who had big dreams, they, they wanted to, uh, and what, what caused them to fail to graduate from high school. And um, it was a fixable problem. And 20 years later, 4.6 million more students have graduated rather than dropping out. And Colin Powell, I enlisted him to be our chair and, and Mrs. Alma Powell. And I think, you know, one of his greatest legacies he was most proud of at the end of his life was, uh, you know, all the children he helped finish high school and go on to college. Um, so a, a real legacy for him. Question from the audience. I would love to hear more about the Service Year Alliance. This is so needed. And I've heard both political sides saying so for years, for example, bringing up the mandatory Israeli two-year public service system. How many people are currently involved, placed? What is your budget? Um, development, expansion expected in the next few years? Thank you. What a wonderful question, beautifully stated. So we were supposed to go to Israel to study the uh, IDF and the civilian counterpart to the Israeli Defense Force system, which is a mandatory requirement to engage in national service, military service, but there are you know, options for civilian national service for those who don't qualify or they opt out for religious reasons. And the pandemic hit, <laughs> so we didn't get to go which was frustrating, but um, General Stan McChrystal, who came back from commanding our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, said that uh, um, less than 1% are serving in our nation's military, leading to the complacent assumption that serving the country is somebody else's job, and um, called for large-scale civilian national service. And so he's the chair, and I'm his vice chair of the Service Share Alliance. Currently, there are uh, 80,000 um, civilian national service opportunities in the United States for young, mostly young people through the Peace Corps that John Kennedy created, VISTA, Lyndon Johnson created, um, uh, AmeriCorps that Bill Clinton created, uh, uh, the NCCC, and then there's a whole large program, about 200,000 Americans who go into the senior corps, including like an encore career, you finish your first career and then you do something big for the country as an encore. We're working to grow that number to, um, from 80,000 to 250,000 on the path to a million. And the reason we, we were trying to reach a million is that it'd be a quarter of an age cohort. So imagine being at a, you know, a dinner or something and young people say, hey, where'd you go to college? In addition, they say, hey, wh where'd you do your service year? And it starts to move the culture. You go to go board an airplane and instead of you know, just the military, you know, active military can board. It's also active civilian national service members can board. Um, so that's what we're working toward. And the good news is we, we wrote the first draft of the Civilian Climate Corps. It's in the reconciliation bill in Congress. If it passes, it'll be the largest investment in civilian national service since Franklin Roosevelt's Civilian Conservation Corps. So we're keep your fingers crossed for the passage of that bill this summer. <laughs> Congratulations, that, that, that's really an exciting advancement. So your previous work um, on malaria has also given inspiration to your current collaborative work and also enabled some parts of it, especially in Africa. Maybe you can tell us more about how you use it to bridge the COVID gap. Good, so test and treat. I mean, what's interesting is malaria, um, you know, with the rapid diagnostic testing, and uh, the, the uh, miraculous ACTs, artemisinin, artemisinin combination therapies, you know, tackle this falcipium, plasmodium falciparum, this very dangerous parasite. 
that needlessly kill still about 400,000, um, mostly people in sub-Saharan Africa today. The good news is that infrastructure, thanks to the President's Malaria Initiative, the Global Fund, the World Bank's Malaria Booster Program, uh, investments from countries around the world, um, has really uh, enabled an, a health infrastructure that's incredibly valuable to COVID response. And so um, having those tools work in partnership, not only to combat malaria, but to combat COVID uh, is, a, is a, 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 a wonderful serendipitous uh, development. So we, we are COVID collaborative, again, thanks to a lot of extraordinary people uh, um, initiated the COVID accountability platform for glo uh, global response and had a pretty good uh, impact on the second global summit that the president led and with uh, a greater focus on increasing vaccination rates, increasing testing, and then testing and treatment and leveraging uh, the infrastructure, uh, for example, malaria uh, to COVID and COVID to malaria. Um, eventually, I hope to see a vaccine that's, uh, I know you're working on this, Melanie, um, <laughs> and Nevin, that, you know, is a multi-purpose, you know, think about it from the perspective of the individual something that tack tackles multiple viruses uh, would be very powerful. But the malaria infrastructure and the AIDS infrastructure really helped us if we can do a better job, you know, linking them and continuing to support them. I have a question from the audience from Ling Thayo. Thank you for all that you do. Antimicrobial resistance AMR will eventually kill more people than COVID and AIDS combined, especially in developing countries. What are your thoughts on how to address that issue? Ooh, that's that's the kind of question I turn back to you and the experts. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. And uh, I don't know the state of art and I don't like to speak to things I don't know enough about. So I'm gonna be cautious on that one, but it's a big insight. And uh, you know, we work, we work with a lot of institutes around the United States where that issues come up and also some great institutes in, in England and other countries. And so uh, I'll leave that to you and uh, would love to get it. When, when we have a solution, you will bring it out. Yeah, we'll bring money. it to scale. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yes, thank you, Ling. Um, so, so when you look back, what, what is the major lessons that you have learned in the, in the past two years? And, and how do you think this will inform um, you know, going forward, but but what what was right and what was what needs to be improved? You know, one one reflection is just how critical national leadership is. It doesn't mean it's a national response, but just the messaging and the leadership, the signals from the president and other leaders, you know, governors and not just political leaders, uh, just so critical particularly in the time of a pandemic, which is a, a whole country, whole world um, uh, effort to be effective. The second is how critical the, 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 the messaging um, and the credibility uh, is established early and it's lost early. And it's hard to get it back once you uh, shake the foundations of that credibility. Um, the third is just the dangers of, I mentioned, the politicization of, of public health. And in the process, the undercutting of, but we're working with the American Public Health Association, the wonderful Georges Benjamin and Judy Monroe at the CDC Foundation and a whole bunch of folks. And Melanie, we're going to drag you back into it <laughs> as we do everything. Um, to, to how do we shore up the uh, public health authorities and their credibility and remind the American people of the incredible role that public health plays in this country, you know, to keep us safe and functioning and, you know, even our economy and schools open. The other lessons were, you know, very specific issues that the country was late on testing, rapid antigen testing is the transmissibility test, as you all know, is, is, is you know, is, is uh, very empowering of Americans. And, I, and we came to that later than we should have. Um, the efficient supply chain management for vital commodities, masks, vaccines, test treatments can all be improved. Health inequities. I was so pleased when Dr. Marcella uh, Nunez Smith was appointed to, to lead the effort to ensure that um, health inequities were addressed. And we brought in the 
various associations and groups, um, you know, working like a laser on these issues and these populations, but still such incredible gaps um, in, equi in, in equity in this country and around the world. Um, so those were a few of the things. So the last thing I'll say is I, we brought in Phil Zellico early on to the COVID collaborative. He had, I'd worked with him on the Federal Election Reform Commission. It was uh, co-chaired by President Carter and President, President Ford. And it led to passage of major legislation in the Congress uh, to improve our election system. And uh, then he ran the 9-11 Commission and was so effective at 98% or something of the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission were implemented. We didn't have another terrorist attack on the United States after 9-11. And uh, although we have domestic terrorism now, sadly. Um, so Phil was brought in early to envision a pandemic commission uh, to learn lessons from COVID and other uh, responses to outbreaks. And it did over 200 interviews. I know he talked to you, Melanie and Monica and Bob and, and various people uh, at the Institute. And um, my hope is that will move forward in some form, but Congress has gotten, uh, uh, has some bills introduced and it's kind of a dysfunctional <laughs> government uh, these days, it's hard to get things done. So we're, we're trying to figure out if it's a congressional appointed commission or a uh, independent commission that emerges from the outside. That's, that's great. We have another question from the audience from Ursula schulze gammen How do you reach young people who are getting most of their information from social media, which includes a ton of misinformation, especially yeah. young people who are not in school or college? Yeah, great. Those are the opportunity youth. There are millions of Americans or, you know, who are uh, 16 to 24 who aren't um, in school or employed. And so how do you, you know, how do you reach them? Good news is we, I was on the uh, White House Council for Community Solutions. President Obama directed us to focus like a laser on that population. And one, we learned, you know, how best to connect with them and through what means, including social media but also networks of national service programs that we're engaging them as a lifeline back to school and work like Youth Build is a good example or Year Up or uh, Green City uh, uh, Force, um, Earth Conservation Corps. And uh, uh, combating uh, disinformation and misinformation is actually the, our fifth sustainable democracy goal um, that we're working on out of this more perfect initiative is very complicated. Uh, given the, you know, in my day, you grew up with three networks, <laughs> and you had Walter Cronkite, and you kind of had pretty much a sense of shared truth. Uh, and today, with the uh, atomization of news media and people getting uh, their news sources and information from so many different places, there's just the opportunity, including with the bots, for a um, uh, uh, terrifically uh, damaging uh, disinformation, misinformation. What we did is we, in, in addition to all these PSAs and, and engaging all these sectors and these networks, we, we tried to reach networks that reach opportunity youth to the questioner's good point. And then second, you know, use social media extensively, including the social media platforms um, that were, you know, causing some of the problem. That's, yeah. More to say, but I'll stop there. Yeah, but I think it really feeds sort of in the larger question. You mentioned loss of trust in government. You just mentioned dysfunctional government. Um, so how can we, you know, correct, especially information about the pandemic and bring correct scientific information to people um, despite or, you know, in the context of these, um, of these, these other phenomenons? Yeah, it's a big, big problem. Uh, what gives me hope is a lot of uh, independent journalism at the local levels emerging. Uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting has 125 public media affiliates um, who tend to, you know, pre pretty honest and direct and kind of an, uh, presenting information and news and then open dialogue. Um, there are a lot of outlets that have that kind of reach. And I so I think notwithstanding the national dysfunction, you know, and the conflict it breeds, 
and some, you know, obviously the breeding of <laughs> through social media and the conflict it breeds. The problem is the revenue structures, people are making a lot of money off of dividing the country and getting people to go to the extremes. Uh, and how we address that, not just for COVID response, but for, you know, I worry sometimes whether our pluralistic democracy will survive in America, given where we are. And um, so we've got a very creative group innovating to hack that problem, but we certainly don't have it hacked. But I do think independent local journalism uh, is, one, is one way uh, to address it. And then getting the social media companies that are, again, the revenue models are uh, um, unfortunate uh, to make common cause and put guardrails, even Meta and Facebook are, are begging for regulation <laughs> in, in their ads. Uh, there have to be guardrails that foster a civil dialogue and a civil society and, and a stronger lurch toward shared truth. But if I had the answer, Ooh, that would be good. <laughs> President Obama gave two stunning speeches, one at Stanford and one at the University of Chicago on this very topic in the last uh, three weeks. And, and those, if you haven't seen them, it should be, should be viewed. Tell us more about the Pandemic Commission. Um, you know, that's really something you have been pushing. Um, tell us what, what is your vision here? Who should be on it? And, and would that be also something that would sort of supersede the dysfunctional government situation? Yeah, so, have? you know, Phil Zellico's superpower is commissions. He, he did this 9-11 commission that resulted in a best-selling book that brought in the right institutions and experts that ensured that the recommendations were actually implemented which is very unusual. Lots of times task forces and commissions, they do fantastic work. There's a report, uh, but it's less clear the relationship between the report's recommendations and, and what actually emerges in terms of action. And so Phil went ahead and tapped top experts, institutions around the country, conducted over 200 interviews, um, not just looking at, at the COVID experience, but uh, HIV, AIDS, SARS, Ebola, um, what happened, what was the national response like, what was the relationship between the national response and the international response, what were the various flaws in the system that needed to be addressed and how would, could those be addressed. And we were moving along um, wanting to create an independent commission that would emerge for, from the country for the country. So it wasn't politicized in any way because the minute Congress makes appointments, that's a political process. Political processes aren't you know, necessarily bad. That's how we function. Uh, but in today's environment, we worried, given the politicization of COVID response, that it could become very political and unproductive. Uh, Richard Burr and Patty Murray introduced a bill. We gave comments on it. We were really encouraged by it. I just don't know if it's going to move. And so the question we're left with is a little bit of the chicken and the egg. We don't want to move if Congress is going to move because that would overtake our process. And for the independent commission to move, it also has to have like funding and a structure. And the funders probably don't want to invest in it until they understand the landscape. And then the last issue is we have to have cooperation from the federal government. We have to access, I don't think we, you know, we don't need subpoena power, but we we, had to, we have to have a level of cooperation for documents and interviews with those who were in the middle of the response so that we really see the full picture. Is that helpful? Yeah, it is. Who, who do you think should be on that commission? Um, Melanie oh, Ott. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> with your wings in the is background. <laughs> my wings? I lend you my wings. <laughs> but oh, I I'm, actually I'm actually serious. People who have tremendous competence and expertise and come at this with a um, science evidence-based approach. But you also need to marry that with, you know, policymakers. So former governors, uh, state health commissioners, people in the, you know, the ASTHO and NACHO and big cities health quality, some of their networks who have to take the evidence and, you know, shape responses in an environment that also looks at the impact on education, the economy, um, communities, uh, our ability to function. 
So I think it needs to think carefully about the marriage of science and evidence and expertise with uh, decision makers would be my, my thought, but I'd love to hear other people's perspective. Yeah, sounds, sounds right. I think you need people with connections and knowledge of how things work. Yes, because um, the governors, the two governors, Governor Sebelius and, and Levin and Governor Deval, Patrick and, and Dirk Kempthorne, Republicans and Democrats, different areas of the country, had wonderful insights on things that would get traction and work and also things that wouldn't. And uh, that's an important part of the, the practical picture of how we can respond. Yep, another question from the audience, Curlia Young asked, you mentioned how important national leadership is, despite there being a lot of really wonderful and strong leaders like yourself that are combating a lot of public mis and disinformation. How can we go about combating the influence of leaders and public figures that steadfastly want to break down public trust in science and public health leaders? I'll give you an example. There's nothing like the reality of the impact of poor leadership. So a governor in a red state gave misinformation about responding to COVID. And um, a man in that state died because of the misinformation. And his daughter, uh, Kristen, start, started marked by COVID because she, in a sense, is a COVID bereaved child, somebody who actually suffered the consequence of a national or state leader providing misinformation that had huge consequences. I'll give you another example. Um, we learned from our uh, survey of Black Americans that there was a lot of historic trauma from the Tuskegee syphilis study from 1932 to 1972 where black men were denied treatment and you know they were subject to an experiment. President Clinton eventually on behalf of the country apologized uh, for, you know, even though he wasn't president at the time, uh, on behalf of the nation for the, for the uh, 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 horrible set of experiments. But we got the descendants of the Tuskegee syphilis study um, participants uh, in our PSAs talking about the safety and the efficacy of vaccines. So there are a lot of creative ways to combat disinformation and misinformation. My, um, my last thought is elect leaders who believe in science <laughs> because you get someone as president or a governor who is skeptical of science, skeptical of public health, very skeptical of government, and like I, you know, a governor the other day, I saw him on TV, he was in an event and there were these children behind him wearing masks and trying to do the responsible thing. This is a few months ago. And the governor turned around and yelled at the kids for wearing masks. It was like, you know, a civic, it was a civic act on their part. They were actually mindful of people around them, not just themselves. And you have a governor yelling at them. It's just, that to me is, uh, is very poor leadership. And uh, so voting ultimately is the way to correct it. Well, Bridge, where are we now in the pandemic? We have reached a sort of a plateau where people are not so much interested anymore in the pandemic and willing to sacrifice their personal freedom for it. And, uh, you know, it gets pushed down in the news cycle. Um, how do you see the work of the collaboratory, the collaborative, you know, really shaped out in that context now for the for the future? And where do you think you're heading? So a lot of Americans have moved on from the pandemic, but we we have not. <laughs> we are uh, because even if you were moving on from the pandemic, the issues around recovery. Um, so we've been working very hard on uh, an initiative for youth and mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, which is pervasive, the anxiety, the depression, the other traumas coming out of the COVID period, building on, on uh, mental health issues that were predated the, the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, the other thing I worry about is if Congress doesn't fund um, the uh, um, tools we have for COVID response, if we get 
a very large surge in the fall or the winter, which some people are predicting, are we really going to be in the position of having to ration vaccines and boosters and people in making decisions about who is protected and who isn't, particularly with respect to the vulnerable, given 75 plus percent of the the deaths in the United States have been among you know the elderly, uh, um, and of course the immunocompromised. Um, those are the things I really worry about. So we're trying to, you know, we're in regular contact with the White House. We're working on issues of recovery like COVID bereaved children. We're working to shore up public health, working with the American Public Health Association and others. Um, we continue to invest in uh, issues that, you know, we think are essential to, um, um, you know, moving the response forward. Uh, and continue to push and prod as much as we can. Um, we have good reach. We have a really good networks and amazing, you know, leaders and institutions like you, Melanie and Monica and Bob and others. Um, but the American people are really exhausted, <laughs> and it's uh, it's we all have to stay active. Um, it's the only thing we can do to give us hope. Are you are you thinking of including other pathogens, pandemics, looming pandemics like the monkeypox into your collaborative, or do you do you we're not the COVID specific? We're not. I once a CEO when I was in the White House after 9/11 came into me. We had 42 initiatives, um, and he came into me and said, "Bridge, that's all great, but the main thing is the main thing." <laughs> and we and then we ended up focusing like a laser, and the the focus was increasing. Uh, it was the last time America increased, you know, Peace Corps to the highest levels in 40 years and AmeriCorps and VISTA. And the main thing was increasing national service opportunities. Um, and so just like that, we're going to stay focused like a laser on COVID and hope that the investments, the learnings, the work we do benefits other uh, viruses and, and uh, things that might be coming our way. We have another question from the audience. Uh, Patricia, Patricia de Fischru is asking, wonderful conversation, the issues the pandemic brought forth, misinformation, systemic racism, inequities, trauma, and mental health extend beyond COVID. Your work with government is vital. What are your thoughts about use of arts for healing, education, arts for healing, education, and communication? Uh, 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 arts, the arts, arts, the arts. Yes, I love it. Wonderful question. So I, um, we worked with Margot Dracos, who was and Yo Yo Ma, great cellists, uh, on the creation of Artist Corps to mobilize um, young musicians across the country in a year of national service to bring the arts to schools. Um, I think. You know, John Kennedy has this wonderful quote on the, this, the uh, wall of the Kennedy Center in the age of, you know, he mentioned a political leader uh, and then he mentioned an artist that uh, the flourishing of a society, um, it goes hand in hand when you have good national leadership and politics and also a welcoming environment that, that uh, ushers in the arts. In our welcome.us initiative for the reintegration of and resettlement of uh, 76,000 Afghans and 100,000 Ukrainians, um, we had Yo-Yo Ma uh, produce an original piece of, of welcome. And then Farhar Daria, who's like the Beyonce of Afghanistan, <laughs> has been very active in our, and Khalid Husseini, he wrote The Kite Runner. You know, we've have had artists and writers and musicians and people who uh, connect to the culture in a way that elevates the human condition, um, work to do that in our various initiatives. And it's often forgotten by policymakers. And I think it's actually a big insight. Uh, the Aspen Institute does its ideas festival in partnership with its music festival. And it's a wonderful, uh, combination. Sometimes also arts are the only way we can reach the New York Philharmonic went to North Korea. Uh, the Librarian of Commerce, J Jim Billington, was the only person that was led into Iran. So sometimes it's the arts that enable uh, countries that are in conflict to communicate, just like in 
across Republicans and Democrats or people of different faiths that might be fighting. It's the arts and our culture and our common language uh, and common experience that sometimes knits us together. Sorry, that was long. <laughs> and this is an uplifting uh, sort of uh, end to a, to a really deep conversation. Um, thank you very much. I want to uh, alert you all that there is a wonderful website for the COVID Collaborative, uh, www.covidcollaborative.us, all in one word, COVID Collaboratory. A collaborative and you will um, you will um, you know see a lot of the work that uh, we sort of uh, mentioned here in passing but there will also be a lot of uh, inspirations for civic service and for for involvement so check it out if you if you want to uh, bridge I give you the last word uh, before we close I wanted to thank you very much for um, you know really an inspirational conversation wanted to thank you for all you do uh, we touched briefly that you have been now roped into gun safety and I'm really glad you you, you are because that gives me trust that something will happen mm. so um, thank you very much uh, and thank also the audience but I wanted to give you a last word to um to close uh just thank you melanie and monica and bob and nevin and all the wonderful people on this webinar you you know uh unleashing that capacity and talent for public problem solving even in especially in a difficult environment it reminds me uh two of our founders had a famous two of the founders of the country had a famous line from addison's cato that they loved it they said we cannot ensure success but we can deserve it. And I think about that when I work on the COVID collaborative or other issues, you know, it's the, the outer environment so frustrating and complicated, but if we focus every day on doing our part, maybe we'll deserve it. So thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. And you have um, some meetings upcoming um, here and we really look forward to, to, to closer discussions. And thanks thank Melody. Thank you all to the audience and thank you for your great questions. It was really fun. Thank you.